This is part two of my discussion on hacking the Stryker 955 radio. What I wanted to talk about in this section was the only complaint I had in part one about the radio, which was the skipping effect that happened when you move the channel selector very quickly. So when you're trying to get somewhere that's uh, pretty far away in frequency and your impulse is to spin that thing hard and fast, you get the opposite effect because it skips so many channels that it seems to barely move. Well, it seems that I'm not the only person that's concerned about this. I don't hang out in forums, and I guess I didn't do my research into this problem. It seems like there's a lot of other people that have an opinion on this. And I got quite a few messages about this. Most of them were rather hostile. It seems like there are some people out there that have an emotional attachment to the idea that this problem is with the switch. And my statement in the part one video that it was a problem with the microprocessor was not received very well. Well, this is a hobby, guys. We're supposed to have fun and Hacking things is one of the things I do for fun. I'm sorry if I'm stepping on your toes by saying it's a problem with the microprocessor and not the switch, but um, I'll present facts. And it seems that even the folks at Stryker think that there's a problem with the switch. This is from their website. It says, channel selector sometimes skips and doesn't feel as firm as I expected. Well, it also is true that it doesn't feel very firm because I think most of us are used to the rotary switch that was from older radios, especially the 23 channel radios, which were rotary switches that had a very uh, tight detent. So it seems that they even have a solution in the switch at Stryker. But anyway, like I said, I'm gonna provide data here. When I worked at Intel, the engineering manager there had a sign similar to this one in his office. And it says, in God we trust, all others must bring data. I'm a trained and degreed engineer and I believe in the scientific method. And this hocus pocus and black magic stuff that I was hearing in the messages that I got just isn't cutting it. If you really want to discuss this or debate this, show me data. Show me screen captures of uh, oscilloscopes or of logic analyzers like I'm going to do. So don't show up with your beads and rattles and try to pull your witch doctor black magic on me. Okay, enough of the editorial. So, here is the schematic for the circuit board that is behind the faceplate on the 955. There are two processors in this radio. One is on the main board and one is on the circuit board that is behind the faceplate. And what it does, it's, it's got two functions in life. It monitors all of these switches right here and the buttons and the channel selector right here. And whenever there's a change, and it assumes only one thing can change at a time, which is reasonable. Whenever there's one change, it sends information to the main processor and lets it know. So then the main processor, processor updates whatever it needs to, and then it sends a packet back of data to update the display on the uh, subboard. So uh, here's all the LCD controller chips and this processor right here, in addition to monitoring all these switches, also sends out data depending on the packet that it got to these uh, LCD drivers. The other thing that it also controls <clears throat> through this bus is these, uh, three signal, these three signals right here provide uh, information for this uh, digital analog converter to put out an analog voltage into these transistors to change the brightness of the red, green, and blue LEDs. 
So that's all that processor does. So all we really care about is the communication between the main processor and the subprocessor and also the reading of the uh, pulse switch. So here's a schematic uh, I got from Mark Rutherford. Oh yeah, by the way, uh, not all the comments that I got in email and other places were negative. There is a silver lining. There were a few people of like mind that I was able to talk to and I'm now acquainted with uh, a few like-minded folks like Mark Rutherford. Anyway, he provided me a data sheet that is very similar to the pulse switch and this is the uh, internal schematic for the switch. So these connections right here, so there, there's a common ground here. These come out to this and then these pulses are shaped a little bit by this RC with this pull-up resistor and this capacitor. That's a small attempt at uh, switch debounce, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then the output of that is fed to the microprocessor here. So here is the first picture I'm going to show of a connection to the logic analyzer. Um, we have four signals here that are of importance to us. These two signals right here correspond to these two signals right here, which are the up and down signals, which are reversed. As you'll look here, we have a long pulse. When, uh, this, is, this is going uh, in the clockwise direction, so it's up in channel. We have a long pulse here and a short pulse. And it's the opposite when you're going down in channel. You have a long pulse on the up and a short one on the down. So when this processor determines that there's been a pulse in either direction, it sends out a one byte pulse to the main processor to let it know that that event has just occurred. And then the main processor sends back this packet of data. And inside of that packet is the total information known to uh, redraw all the LCD uh, segments, every element, is uh, included in there. So you could change just one minor thing and it sends data back on the whole display every time. It does that every time. So here we go with a very leisurely uh, channel changing event, a couple of them. And this is uh, a counterclockwise movement. So it's counting down in channel, and as you'll see, the up pulse is the one that's uh, affected the most. And then what I'd really like to point out here, and I should have done it before, is that this pulse right here never overlaps with the rising edge of this. Never. So if there is some sort of noise bounce in here, it will happen before it ever gets to this portion of the switch which puts out this. So if you wrote the appropriate software, you could have this negative edge and a whole bunch of noise in here. And then when you had a positive edge immediately followed by this smaller signal, that would be just one pulse instead of what could be legitimized by lesser software into thinking there was many pulses there. But as you can tell, they don't do that. We have a negative edge here and before it ever even rises, or before this ever shows up, it sends out a pulse to the main processor. So I think that the uh, debouncing that's inside of this uh, uh, subprocessor is inadequate. I'll just leave it at that. But anyway, this switch movement is slow enough that, no, that we don't have any problems here. So uh, we have this negative edge, this sends a pulse out to the main, and then the main sends this to update all the uh, display information. And then sometime later, which is not that much later, as you can see here, I measured uh, the, uh, the frequency of uh, the updates, and here it's five hertz, remember that. And you know we've got five pulses here that are followed by five outputs from the 
a subprocessor and five packets from the main processor. So everything's fine here. Here's where we start to have some issues. Uh, the, the, the rate here looks like it's at about 17 hertz, but we had a little issue over here. So when this pulse went negative edge, we had this pulse come out of the subprocessor, but we immediately had something going on here. And I think there was a switch bounce problem in here. And I think what happened is that this pro the subprocessor got confused. And I mean, we, we have one, two, three negative edges. You know, but maybe it didn't get confused. Maybe it did exactly what it was supposed to do because we only have two legitimate pulses in there. So yeah, it put out two pulses, it looks like. Uh, so this is the pulse from the switch, and this is the pulse from the subprocessor, but we lost a pulse in there somewhere, and not sure why. So we have one, two, three, four, five uh, pulses that came out, and over time, it looks like we only had one, two, three, four. So there was a packet coming back from the main processor that was lost. Now we have this packet here, but that looks like it's associated with this one. So we have four packets when it looks like we actually had, I'm sorry, four pulses, bytes, going to the main processor here. But it looks like we actually had five events that should have uh, produced these pulses right here. And we end up with just these packets. Now, this is at 17 hertz. It looks like the main processor is sort of keeping up here. But it also looks like maybe somehow the subprocessor... <laughs> looks like something happened here. It just didn't keep up, and I'm, I'm not sure why. This just should not have happened. Okay, so... This is probably the most interesting picture that I have. In this picture, I tried to spin the channel selector as fast as I could in the uh, clockwise position, in the clockwise direction. And it's very uneven in the amount of time. I mean, I was really spinning it fast. And right here, uh, this is rather interesting. So I think that we probably have uh, a bounce in here, but it could have been properly decoded, which I'll do later and I'll show you. It could have been decoded by a processor that was dealing with this properly. But as you can see, we have one, two, three, four pulses here, and we have uh, some gaps here. So. That was over a time where this was spinning really fast. As you can see between here and here, which is a zoom in of here and here, that was at 108 hertz rate. Now this whole thing isn't 108, but if things are starting to have problems at 17 hertz, you can see that 108 hertz is probably a really big problem. But let's just gloss over this area right here and let's look over here. There's no excuse. So here's the two different pulses coming out of the pulse switch. These are completely legitimate pulses, and we have nothing right here. This is empty. The subprocessor did not send a packet to the main processor, so it really didn't figure out that uh, these happened. That is a skip. If the subprocessor is not going to send data out to the main processor, there's no way that any update is going to happen to the uh, frequency that it thinks it's on. This is the crux of the problem. It does not matter. If you put a better switch here, it doesn't matter. <laughs> the, these pulses are there, and the fact is that the subprocessor cannot keep up with those. That is the problem, pure and simple, full stop, end of discussion, or it should be, but I know it won't be. 
So instead of moving the channel selector and hoping for good screen captures, it makes a little more sense to do this kind of thing under more uh, controllable conditions. So this is me on the top with the down signal, which re results in it counting up in frequency, um, provided by an external generator. And this is at a 40 hertz clock rate. And as you can tell, I didn't set, put anything on the down pulse. So as I suggested before, this thing really isn't paying attention to that other pulse, which is unfortunate because that other pulse could be used to determine when there's noise. And I did that on one of my solutions and you'll see that. But anyway, so at the, uh, the main, pro or, I'm sorry, the uh, sub processor is pr pretty close to being able to keep up at the 40 Hertz clock rate, but it's hopeless for the other processor. I mean, between these two pulses, this packet takes longer than the period between the two pulses that are driving the chip that's producing this. It's hopeless. So one solution, or I should say not a solution, but one part of the solution would be to make this packet happen faster. And if we go back to this, the this processor is receiving and transmitting at a 19.2 kilohertz baud rate. And it's capable of a lot faster than that. But they could just easily double the baud rate and that's just typing to do that. If you have to do it on both ends, obviously, but this chip can handle it. So that's one thing that I would do. And another thing that I would do is I would be a little more regimented about the uh, interrupt control. And I think that's the, the issue. I mean, here, we'll go back here for a minute. They're not gonna change or have to change the hardware. This is already driving the interrupt pins. INT0 and INT1 are interrupt pins. And the processor could be set up so that it responds to those. And I'm not saying it's not using interrupts right now, I don't think it is, but I'm not saying it isn't. I'm just giving you my opinion that I don't think it is. But if they did and they did it properly and they looked at this signal, they could get away or get a, yeah, get away from the problem of, of noise bounce and they could probably keep up with uh, the switch at a faster rate. So anyway, I hope I made my point there. There at 40 Hertz, it, 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 the uh, main processor is hopeless, it can't keep up. So I mentioned I had a couple solutions in my first video. One of the solutions, oh well, before I go on with that, both of my solutions are kind of bolt-on solutions. They're bolting on to what already exists. I don't have access to the code for either of the processors, um, but I'll tell you what, 20 years ago, I designed an electronic control unit for a car computer that it measured RPM, it measured manifold pressure, it measured uh, intake air temperature, it measured coolant temperature, it measured the oxygen sensor, it measured, it had a speed sensor, and it measured, uh, what am I forgetting? Ah, I forgot what I forgot. Anyway, I left out one of the sensors in there. So if you can do that with a 8051, which is the, Mike Rutherford let me know that that subprocessor is a derivative of the 8051. 20 years ago, I was controlling uh, the ignition and the pulse width of the fuel going in to the throttle body with an 8051 that was using a clock speed that's slower than the one they're using here, don't tell me that they can't make this work and just be able to read the switches and get the data from the, uh, the main processor to display on the LCD. I don't believe it. Sorry, I don't. I think I've already shown 
that the switch output is adequate. It's the processor, actually it's not the processor, it's the coding for the processor that I think is the issue. So here is solution number one. Like I say, it's just a bolt on. What I do is I intercept the pulses that are coming from the switch and throw them into my own processor and I get rid of the noise problems that might exist and then I play the, the data back at a slower rate. So you might be going really fast, maybe 40 or 50 hertz with the, with the switch, but I capture each event and then I save it and then I play it back at a rate that the main processor can deal with. And that's exactly what I did here. So up here, these are signals coming from the channel selector, the pulse switch. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 pulses. So that means that it would have, uh, what is that? Decreased in channel by 12 or 13 channels. This, this signal right here is just me bringing out a signal that I produced inside of the processor that determines when a pulse happened. And it's just a, um, a transition. So anytime there's a legitimate pulse, we have a transition here. It's not, it's, it's not the amount of pulses, it's the amount of transitions. Then this right here is the signal that I send out to the, uh, the sub-processor pretending that I'm the channel selector. So I, 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 like, like I said, I, I um, capture all of the information from the channel selector going as fast as I could. Then I play it back at a rate right here that the sub-processor can handle. And then the subprocessor puts out a signal to the main processor. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. So it sends back 13, which is the same amount of pulses we had up here, but it does it at a slower rate. And then the main processor sends these packets back and it's just barely able to keep up. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. So we got 13 pulses up here at a very quick rate, which it couldn't keep up with. And then I sent it these pulses that it could, and it was able to work. And I'm gonna show you that. That's my solution number one. And it, the solution number one is at that 15 Hertz clock rate. So here I changed the clock rate to 40 Hertz. And we already established that the system kind of breaks down at 40 Hertz, but I'm doing it here with a con controlled clock, not with something that is derived from me uh, moving the channel selector really quickly. So this is a little cleaner and I do the same thing. I capture the signals here. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And if you look in here, it looks like was there? Yeah, it looks like there was some noise in here. Yeah, there was a, a bounce in there. Oh, there's a bounce over here too. And I was able to, through software, uh, debounce that inside. And then I sent out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 12 pulses. So I did what the original processor didn't do, which was figure out when there's a, a bounce problem and I don't let it get legitimized into a, a pulse that I think caused a count up or down in channel. So let's see, was the main or the subprocessor able to keep up? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Okay, the subprocessor this time could keep up with the 40 Hertz rate, but there's no way we have 12 pulses there. The main processor could not, and that means that it didn't count 12 pulses, and that would result in skips. So that's it for the screen captures. I wanna show you my two solutions now, but remember, these are bolt-on solutions.
The real solution, if we could get it done, is to fix the code and the processors. And I don't know what that would take. But I like this radio a lot. And I'd be willing to live with either of my solutions. And in some ways, I think solution number two, at least for me, is an upgrade. So let's get the camera out and show what happens with the channel selector when I'm moving it with my two solutions. OK, this is solution number one. This is the one where we discussed I intercept the signals coming from the channel selector. And I put them into a processor, and I clean them up and play them back at a slower rate that both the subprocessor and the main processor can handle. Uh, this is a little convenient or inconvenient right now because I'm having to reach around the camera and try to put my hand on the channel selector and then count off exactly 10 steps. Let's do 10 steps slowly to begin with. So I'm on 3400. So it's flat right now, so 10 steps should be flat on the other side. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And see, the third digit from the right is a 4. So I'm going to try to do this quickly, but land uh, 10 steps. And we'll see how well I do. Well, okay, there you go. So you probably saw that when I was done moving, the numbers were still updating for a little while. That's because it's playing it back at a slower rate than the channel selector was moving. But I just moved it very fast at uh, four times, and there wasn't a skip. So that's solution number one. Well, folks, I mentioned that I had two solutions for this channel selector issue. The first solution was just fixing the existing channel selector so that uh, it didn't have little anomalies when you were moving slowly or when you were trying to move very fast. This solution is completely different. I thought, well, why not make lemonade out of lemons? So. If you're going to mess with this, why not make it even better than it started? So I know that this may not appeal to everybody, and I may be the only person it appeals to. I really like this radio, but I like to use it in the VFO mode. And the radio covers 5 megahertz for crying out loud. So that is a lot of channel selector uh, movement if you're trying to use it in VFO mode and move all over the place. So I came up with something a little different. So this is a knob that is connected to a pot that has a center detent. Some of you may be familiar with this because uh, some radios in the clarifier, the center detent is uh, supposedly uh, center frequency or what we used to call center slot. And what I'm doing here is you're going to hear a little beep and I'll show you the frequency display in a minute. I just wanted to explain what this does. So when it's sitting in the center, it does nothing. If you move it to the right of center, it counts up. If you move it to the left, it counts down. The greater the excursion from center slot, the faster it will go. So when you hear the beep, that will be one uh, channel change per beep. So I'm going to move it clockwise and go up in frequency and you're going to hopefully hear the beep. Okay, that's slow. And then if you keep going, it goes faster. And if you keep going, it'll go faster and then faster and then faster. That's really fast. And then if you go back, it goes off. And the same thing goes when you turn it counterclockwise. This will go down in frequency. Okay, so right now this is rather crude. Uh, I'm going to make it a little better. I'm going to make the frequency transitions 
a little more fluid and analog instead of the digital steps it has right now. But it's completely usable the way it is right now. The um, beep is there because I found out that a little beep, like it would be in the speaker in the 955, is a little better feedback than using the display. I mean, look, if you just want to change one frequency, there, boom, you're done. Or if you want, you know, to move slowly, you can, or that's pretty fast, or I mean, that's faster than you can go right now with the channel selector the way it is. So, like I say, this may not appeal to everybody, but being able to move quickly through the VFO is a benefit to me. And if you can go at 37 uh, channel changes a second, you can move around that 5 megahertz rather quickly. So I'll come back and show the movement of the display with the uh, knob movement. Alrighty, I've moved the camera over to the 955 display. I'm hoping that when I move the pot, you'll be able to still hear the beep. We'll find out when I play this back. Okay, so now I'm going to move the pot off of center slot and we will go slowly and then pick up this pace a little bit and then go a little faster and then go a little faster and then go damn fast and then we'll come back down and then we'll go down in frequency whatever you want to do alright so that's idea number two and I don't know if there's a switch in existence that maybe would allow both of these uh, I'd have to look into that but I doubt it anyway I hope you enjoyed that and if you didn't well Keep your thoughts to yourself. <laughs>